Hey everyone, I hope you're doing okay. <laughs> nice to see you again this week, or you see me, I guess. Just a couple of, of announcements. Um, uh, first, uh, I'm kind of sending feelers out there. I don't know what the climate of the world is going to be like on a week-to-week -week basis and how things unfold, but when they do unfold, it, it tends to happen very quickly. And so I'm um, trying to put some things in place uh, beforehand so that way we're, we're ready for when things, if they happen, that we're ready for them. And uh, one, one of the things that I, I know that has been difficult throughout COVID is connecting with each other, is the fellowship uh, that happens uh, with each other. And I mean, church means gathering of people. It means ecclesia, like gathering of people. Um, and we're not really able to do that too much. And so one of the things that uh, I felt in my heart was uh, to find a way to gather in a trusted and safe manner. And so I wanted to just kind of get a feeling out there of how many people, how many of you, uh, would be interested in a small group kind of thing. I emphasize the word small. Uh, this way uh, we, we can... So the idea of the small groups is that you have some friends or family or bubbles, if you will, of people that you trust, uh, of people that you can communicate openly with. Uh, so that way, you know, it's all based on trust. So you can say, hey, uh, I have family visiting this week. I'd like to quarantine sometime before I meet with the group. That uh, You guys have a, a good built of trust in each other. And it's your bubble, uh, your group, your bubble of people so that it's not just you know, uh, expanding or growing from all different directions and whatnot, but your trusted group of people in a way that allows you to work through a book or study the Bible or, you know, help to, to promote, you know, prayer and love for each other and connecting uh, with each other and with God. And so the idea for me was that I'd be able to pick some leaders uh, who have their own bubble, uh, and I can pour into them and then they can go out into their sphere of influence, if you will, or their bubbles. And you guys can meet whenever you feel comfortable um, and be able uh, to, to gather, to pray with each other, to love on each other and encourage each other and to study and to do a little bit of study. So this way I'm pouring into a leader, leaders pouring into you. And if you guys have any questions, then it gets back to me without spreading, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and we're not all hanging out together, but there, there are bubble groups, if you will. And so just to know, I wanted to know if you were interested in something like that. Uh, if you could send me a message, that way, you know, if there's a lot of interest, then we can begin tackling the logistics of that uh, in a manner that has safety at its forefront and also your well-being. <laughs> okay, so it, it was an idea. Um, and, and so just trying to get a feeler out there for you, okay? Uh, so that's announcement number one. <clears throat> How do you feel about a small group that you're comfortable with? A bubble of people that you are comfortable with, okay? So that's announcement number one. Uh, announcement number two, uh, we have a board member who has uh, stepped down and um, constitutionally it says that the rest of the board uh, meets together and we appoint someone um, until the next business meeting, which is coming up in February of the church. Uh, so I wanted to let you know that that is a process that, that has begun. Uh, so just to, to make you aware. Um, and yes, the Constitution talks about the appointment of. So as uh, I think this is really important and, and really, I don't know, it's really good because as a board we get to pray on and truly think about and feel in the spirit where God is leading us to who, who we would like to sit on the board uh, until the next business meeting and allows us to look for you know spiritual maturity and other characteristics um, and so it's a unique opportunity um, you know and it's it's good <laughs> okay so that that's announcement number two otherwise um, continue to pray for the mental uh, health of people um, their eyes people are still locked up in their homes and feeling disconnected and there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that goes on along with loneliness and other things so continue to pray for uh, the mental health of our of our congregation um, I had a prayer request specifically for a gentleman named Don Prince he's a minister um, that made an impact on one of the people that attend the church and um, he, he uh, has COVID 
And so he's working through that. And uh, so we wanted to pray, uh, to pray and uplift him. And I imagine he's not the only one, that there are uh, a lot of other people that are suffering through this. Uh, so to continue to keep them in your prayer and uh, that God's work can continue to be done. Um, and so, so there you go. On that note, uh, let me just pray for a moment. Father God, I always pray for wisdom, uh, wisdom in all situations, God, that you help to guide me and lead me and lead us all, God, through all of this. I pray that you speak through me, God, into the hearts of your people. Um, don't let me get in the way, God, but speak, speak directly to them, Lord. We pray for the people that are struggling, being alone, feeling disconnected, God, uh, that you send the right people in their lives to, to come reconnected uh, with you and with each other, God, so that we can encourage each other and uplift each other and love on each other. Father God, I pray for the people who are struggling with the illness, God, that uh, you give them strength and healing, uh, divine healing. So there are opportunities for other people to see uh, an incredible miracle done by your hands and that these people can attest and say, this is all God's doing. This is all God's work. And other people can be amazed and begin to believe. And I love moments like that, God. So I pray for those moments. I also pray for wisdom uh, for the doctors and nurses as they uh, navigate this, God. Um, will you do a work through them and give them, you know, knowledge and wisdom in all situations? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So uh, we have been working through um, our spiritual giftings. Here we go. <laughs> right. Um, I set forth by Peter Wagner's book. Uh, your spiritual gifts and uh, I've enjoyed even this past week working with some of you uh, being able to explore some of the way God has gifted you uh, and it's an exciting process because you get to you get to see how God has made you uh, unique in your own way and, and gifted you in a way and as you begin to discover giftings it gets exciting because the more you learn about yourself and about them the more you can grow in them so like when you first take the test I remember when I first took it I had like lots of eights and nines and I was like my goodness I feel like I have no gifts at all and but as gifts began to be identified and I learned that that was a part of who I was I was able to then train in those gifts and work on them and passionately begin to build them up so that now when I go back and I take the test uh, I have like numbers that are like 13 14 15 um, and I'm a lot more confident in those gifts um, you know, and it, it's fun to go through that process because God reveals to you a part of who you are. And, and then you get to work in that and build up in that. And it's, it's a fantastic process. So I've enjoyed with the people that I've had the opportunity this past week to work with that. Um, otherwise... For, for the rest of you, don't be afraid to, to give me a shout. I'd love to meet with you and spend some time with you discovering a little bit about who you are. Okay, fun times. Okay, so this week I wanted to talk about evangelism. Now, personally speaking, evangelism is, evangelism is one of my higher traits uh, that I score high highly on. And uh, I'll give you the exact definition in a moment. Uh, but for me, a large part of what evangelism is, is uh, reaching people in such a way that they receive. And there's, there's a key to that because I know that there are people that, uh, that go out and they try to, to reach people for Christ. And, uh, but they go, I don't know, maybe too prepared, if you will, <laughs> with, with an agenda. Um, and, and they like granted everyone should be able to have a little bit of evangelism and and reach out to people uh, but each person is a little bit different and if they're not receiving right then it's not actually evangelism because you're not actually reaching them you might have the message of Christ um, but if they're not receiving it evangelism isn't actually happening so it's being able to reach people with the message of Christ in such a way that they receive and they begin to grow in who Christ is they themselves okay so um, from the book <laughs> it says the gift of evangelism is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to share the gospel with unbelievers in such a way that men and women become Jesus's disciples and responsible members of the body of Christ. And so there, there's kind of two parts to this because they have reached, right, and they've begun to understand the message of Christ, but then becoming a disciple is like a, a step further because now they're beginning to walk 
in, in Christ's footsteps, and they're beginning to grow in that direction. So it's not just reaching, but it's also having an effect uh, that allows people to grow closer to God. Now, uh, when I think of evangelism, there are different ways of evangelizing to people, of reaching out to people, if you will. Um, I think biblically, when Peter got up and he preached a message and it says that 3,000 people were saved, that there is a power of the Holy Spirit, a presence of God that people uh, begin to feel, and they know that there, there's something beyond what they can sense and normally, and it resonates with them spiritually. And so I call this presence, <laughs> presence evangelism, if you will, uh, and people begin to make a decision for Christ without fully understanding who he is, and then begins a discipleship process where they begin to study and learn, but they make the decision first because they know that something something deeper is going on, okay? And so there, there's like presence evangelism. Then there's uh, something called proclamation um, evangelism, and that is to make known the word of God in such a way that it's understood, but whether or not people become Christians, um, does it matter? You're there to proclaim God's word, right? And so they, they receive it, but they haven't necessarily made a decision one way or another. So it doesn't really include building up disciples. And it's it, it's about reaching people through the message of Christ, um, but it kind of stops there. And then uh, there, there is this one. Uh, it's called persuasion. <laughs> and it's the idea of debating and talking about and... Uh, really delving into things and evangelizing a person until they've made a decision. And if they've made a decision against, then your job isn't done yet. <laughs> You're going to keep on trying and, and pushing and, and, you know, uh, until they begin to, you know, come alongside and making uh, a decision. Okay. Now there's pros and cons to a little bit of each of those. Okay. Some people are already like, oh boy, I don't like this method. Or, you know, how does that method even like really work? Or, you know, um, but there are different ways to reach people, and so I wanted to dig a little bit into uh, into a little bit of all of that. Now, uh, for me personally, I tend to be more of a proclamation kind of guy. Um, so now it's interesting because as a pastor, it is my job to equip people um, for God's gifts and, and to edify the church and to reach out. Uh, so I am invested in the longevity um, of spirit of people's spiritual well being. Uh, but my evangelist heart, when I reach out into the world, um, I tend to talk about God. I tend to talk about uh, who, how he has made me who I am. And I talk about the stories of my life. Uh, and I reach people in that way. And, you know, I, I hope I get an opportunity to invest more. Uh, but I come from the understanding that uh, sometimes... I'm going to enter someone's life and plant seeds. Sometimes I'm going to enter someone's life and uh, water those seeds uh, and, and begin to invest in someone. And sometimes someone's done all that work already, and I'm there to help cultivate a harvest and a firm decision for Christ. So I see it as more uh, an investment or long-term kind of thing, and I try to gauge how God wants to use me in that situation. Um, I think of it as a scale, and I'll get more into this later on, but I think of it as like... Uh, a negative 10 to 10 scale, <laughs> okay? As in not for God at all, and then, you know, following God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, 10 over here and minus 10 over there, uh, zero being somewhat indifferent. And, and I think that sometimes God may call me to reach someone who's a minus 10 and wants like nothing to do with God and be able to reach them, to bring them to be a minus nine. That's not a huge jump. That doesn't sound like I've done huge strides and really reached the person, but... If they have not been able to get to minus nine, then the next person who's going from minus nine to say minus six wouldn't be able to do what they were going to do, right? And so I feel like each step of the process is immensely important. And uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer and sometimes it can happen instantaneous, um, but that's more all up to God. And then we need to serve and in our reaching out and be sensitive to where people are at. So I tend to fall a little bit more on proclamation. I love stories. It is a part of uh, who I am. And I think that the whole story thing, I look at it as like, I want to be a part of someone's, uh, someone else's story. As in, they can look back on their life and say, 
you know, uh, there was a point in my life I didn't believe in God. I didn't like God. I wanted nothing to do with God. But this person came into my life and something began to change. And then you become part of their story. You know, it's like uh, having a lady who, who tests out church. You know, she tests it out. It's like, oh, I don't know about these people. I'm not sure about this place. You know, I'm feeling very uncomfortable. And they come out a couple of times, and then someone finds out it's their birthday. And they bake them the cake, and they come to church. It's like, yay, we're so happy it's your birthday. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, my goodness, these people actually care about me. They, they actually, This person took the time to make me a cake. And now I'm not so afraid to come out to church anymore. And so, you know, I understand that these people... Maybe they care for me a little bit. And so they start coming out with a little bit more encouragement and it's not such a scary thing. And so, and later on in life, when they look back, they're like, I will never forget when this person made me a cake. And you may think of it as such a simple and small thing, but you have made yourself part of that story because you were obedient to Christ in doing what he had asked you to do to reach out to this person. And even though like, you may have been the one who brought them from negative 10 to negative 9, may not seem like a huge jump. You didn't take them to number 10, positive 10, right? You, you just took them one, one number closer to God. But that's what may have sparked the rest of their journey with Christ. And so I feel like uh, we need to pay attention for those moments uh, of when we can pour into someone's life um, and be a part of their story, okay? But we all have even our own stories, and that that's actually, it, it's fun, okay? And we're, God makes us each a little bit differently. And of course, the end is always very important that people eventually reach Christ. Um, but, but there you go. Okay, um, personally speaking, Stories have always been an important part of my life. I used to read a lot of fiction and or watch movies, and eventually that came into, I watched anime, um, and I, I somehow felt uh, close to God through reading almost any story. Because any time in a story that I got to read that someone did something courageous, someone inspired someone, or inspired a nation, or inspired a different decision, when, when there is a heroine and they're willing to risk their lives, I've always felt like all of that, all those tear-jerking moments point to who God is. And so I'm like, I think of Optimus Prime in Transformers who's willing to sacrifice his life to give humanity a fair chance at making their own good or bad decisions. And, and, and I'm like, wow, you know that Christ sacrificed his life for us so that we had every opportunity to turn to him. And, and so moments like that, in every story I've ever read, I've always somehow felt like it reflects who God is. Now, those moments of true inspiration, I'm like, are moments that I recognize my God who loved me so much that he came down to die for me. And it's, I've always related it in that way. It's always pointed me towards God. And, and so... I came to a point where when I got into anime um, that I, I found out that people dress up as their favorite characters and I was like, oh my goodness, this, this, is, this is a little bit crazy, but it sounds kind of fun. And, and so um, at the same time, I felt like, what, what a way to reach people. I, can you imagine being, you know, so you're an evangelist, okay, and you're trying to reach people and one of your passions that God has given you is fishing. Okay, and you drive down the street and, and you see, like, spread apart by maybe a couple kilometers, you see people with fishing rods and they're walking, and, and someone else with a fishing rod, and someone else with a fishing rod. And, and it's your passion. It's like, my goodness, God is giving me an in. I, I just get to be here and I can talk to them about fishing. And then, you know, maybe, maybe somehow I can talk about. You know how God was a fisher of men and, and tried to reach people and train people and teach them about love and, and you know, uh, and, and so can you imagine picturing all of a sudden people with fishing poles everywhere and it's like, oh my goodness, God's giving me a huge opportunity. And so in the same way, uh, I fell in love with certain heroes um, and I made a costume uh, that for me, I felt a connection with a character who was willing to sacrifice his life to save someone. And so he had like angel wings and a four foot sword and a breastplate and chain mail. And so I made a costume to, you know, to represent all of that. It was a lot of work. And then I remember the insecurities that I felt. Um, 
it was terrifying. Okay, I remember being in the basement garage, parking the car, opening up the trunk, and then slowly, slowly putting on these pieces of armor uh, and my costume on and being terrified. I'm like, you know, because I, I had gone to a convention before uh, and I noticed that almost one in three people were dressed up. And so it was kind of exciting and terrifying. And so now here I am about to take part in this. And, and I'll never forget that, you know, that day of just how insecure I felt. I felt foolish. Um, and, and so then, then I came out and uh, came out of the garage and I got to see other people dressed up. And I'm like, this isn't so bad, at least I'm not the only one, <laughs> you know? And then slowly, slowly people would come and ask, hey, can I take your picture? Uh, I recognize who you are. And before they left, other people came to take pictures. And I was like, oh my goodness, people will like know who I am. This isn't so bad. And then I met other people who were dressed up from the same anime cartoon. Um, and, and started making friends. And I was like, this this is incredible. And, and a thing I began to see and understand, and it was very interesting because coming into the situation, I had to cross this street, and I'll never forget that there were picketers, um, Christian picketers who were picketing that because people were dressing up that they'd go to hell. And I was like, oh boy, here I am. And I picked this character because he, he reminds me of God a little bit. Uh, and what God has done for us, and apparently I'm going to help because I wanted to dress up. Uh, and, and it was intimidating and scary, and you know, but I, I just kept on. And eventually by, by the end of the day, and I'm an evangelist at heart, uh, I had a group of people, 15, 20 people, um, that were all part of the same anime, and uh, I made friends. And I realized that a lot of the people there were the outcasts of society were people that in their own spheres of influence were picked on and ostracized and for all kinds of different reasons, but they all felt isolated and alone. And at this convention, they felt like they could be who they were, you know, that they didn't need to be ashamed or anything. And so I'll never forget the evening of my, you know, of, of <laughs> that, that conference convention. And I ended up in some hotel room. There were like 15 people in this hotel room. It was very busy and all kinds of uh, stuff going on. And um, and so I was a little bit older than, than other people. Uh, I was 23. Most people were between 16 to 20. I still had generally four or five years above everyone. And they were kind of like, you know, surprised that someone older would even dress up. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's fun. And, and we got to conversing. Uh, and they wanted to know about me and my family. I was married and had a child, and so they wanted to know about my family and stuff. And then eventually comes out the fact that I was a pastor or in ministry. And it, it was like silence in the room. You know, people's alcohol bottles kind of slipped behind their backs like, oh my goodness. You know, and, and, and in that moment, I seized the opportunity. It was like, listen guys, um, you know, someone might swear and be like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, listen, I, I didn't judge you. I didn't judge you before. I accepted you as you were. Can you accept me as I am? You know, I, I never told you that, you know, your swearing is wrong or I wasn't here to condemn you or, you know, to point any fault or, or anything. I was just here enjoying my day like you. You know, please don't make me feel super different. And right away they understood that even in that moment, I felt like the outside one, right? And, and so they all, well, I guess they were themselves, but they had seen something different all of a sudden. And they were like, you're a pastor? But how's that possible? We passed by the picketers that said we were going to hell. How is it that you're dressed up? Or how is it that... And I spent most of the evening till the early hours of the next day uh, answering questions about God. Because all of a sudden they were like, well, this is different. You're talking about, you know, we're so used to God representing someone who condemns us all the time and, and you know we're, we're never acceptable and all of a sudden you're talking about a God who loves and cares for who we are well how does this work and how does that work and there, there's a million questions and I was all too happy to begin to explain who God was in my life and, and be able to share with them and doors were opened and they were ready to receive but I can imagine if I just came in uh, with, with, with an agenda and it was just like you know, God says, and you know, uh, the doors would be closed and, and I would have no opportunity to reach people. Uh, but God had orchestrated all of this and God had used my insecurities, 
in that garage, <laughs> you know, and he used it for his strength. And he orchestrated an opportunity to reach people with the message of Christ. And let me tell you that when I went home that night, I, I drove home in tears, you know, that I had such an opportunity to reach people and to share love with people and, and that God cared about who they were, you know. And, and a lot of those people there, you know, they, they're still in contact with me. I see them on occasion or hear from them on occasion through Facebook and whatnot. And it's, it's an honor to have played a part in their story. Um, and so, you know, God uses you and your story and, and your personality to reach people, no matter who you are, what background you've had. Part of evangelism, I mean, is part of something that we should all be looking forward to. Opportunities to reach people with the message of Christ. And it takes all kinds of people, business-oriented people, uh, immensely logical people, people who need tangible proof, artistic people, impulsive people. God has fearfully and wonderfully made all of us. And he can use those personalities, all aspects of it, to do his work, right? And, and so you can never make that too small of a thing, okay? I mean, when, when I think about um, sorry. I think about how God makes us each differently and how he uses that difference to, to make a difference in other people's lives. I, I, I think back and I'm like, my goodness, all you need is a big heart for God, a love for his people, right? God loves them and we should love them too. And then a little bit of life experience. And I giggle because I wrote down in my notes, my goodness, by the time you're age four, you should be able to have enough life experience to reach someone. And, and I think, you know, my crayon broke. My goodness, my crayon is broken and I don't know what to do with that. And someone is crying, you know, their crayon is broken. It's like, well, you can look at it this two ways. You had one crayon that is now broken into two and how sad that is. Or now God has given you two different crayons. And now we can, you can work and I can work on the same paper together. Before when there was only one, we couldn't do that. You know, and so I'm like, even at an incredibly young age, you can begin to have experiences that God can use to reach people, right? And, and so all it takes is a bit of wisdom, <laughs> an understanding of who you are, and not to be ashamed of who you are, whatever that might be. I know people who are rough around the edges, but I know people that need to be reached from people that are a little bit rough around the edges. And I know some people that are a lot more caring and soft-spoken, and I know people that need a gentle touch. God can use anybody. And we should all in one way always be looking forward to be doing God's work, looking for opportunity to reach people, to encourage people, to love people, and, and begin to make a difference. Um, my wife, she giggles at me because uh, being of an evangelist heart, I can almost be in any situation and reach people. Uh, I've been told, listen, we're doing this group gathering. You prob This person that you might meet, they'll probably never set foot into a church, you know. And you should definitely not tell them that you've ever dressed up. Uh, that would not go over well. And, uh, you know, you should probably just avoid them. <laughs> and so I go to this event, and lo and behold, an hour into the event, who am I with? The one person everyone told me that I probably should not talk to. And we're talking about hockey and uh, how I was working in a school that trained kids for the NHL. And it was an, and, and my wife smiles and giggles. She's like, you know, God just uses you. Whatever experience you've had to be able to reach such a different crowd of people, no matter what, everyone thought you would not get along with this person. But here you are and God's giving you an opportunity to begin to pour into this person. Wow. Now, that being said, uh, let, let's get into some practical here, okay? Uh, I want you to know that God didn't always have, Jesus didn't have high expectations of people who did not know him. Okay, not people who did know him, people who did not know him. It's not like Christ was like, oh, there's a sinful person. I'm going to avoid them like the plague. I'm not going to talk to them. Uh, they have missed the mark. I'm not going to bother uh, with my time. If anything, Christ did the opposite. He spent most of his time with people who did not know him. Okay, And I think, I think of Zacchaeus, and I'm coming from Luke chapter 19, uh, and I wanted to have fun with this one. 
Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was one of the most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business. Pay attention to how it's worded. Jew, influential Jew in the Roman tax collecting business. Wow, this is business. <laughs> Ultimately, since Roman was in control of everything and the Jews were underneath the Romans, under Roman rule, if you will, that the way the Romans collected their taxes is not by sending Romans in to collect the taxes. That would make them feel like, you know, big bullies, if you will, and they would probably cause rioting and stuff. So that wasn't probably the smart way to do it. And the best way to do it is to get a representative of the people uh, for the people to be collecting the taxes. And so you would have someone who was Jewish to collect Jewish taxes. And it was a business. So it was along the lines of, we're not actually going to pay you for this, but you need to do this job because we need to collect our taxes. And so you could set your own wage. Now, you can imagine that by setting your own wage, what you thought was fair and what everyone else thought was fair probably did not line up. You know, you made $100,000 this year. I feel like I should get 20000 of that as payment and uh, the, the rest will go towards your taxes and you owe 100000 in taxes. And that person's like, what? I have to give you an extra twenty grand? No! Isn't the hundred grand enough that I pay my taxes and it's... You know, now, now all of a sudden, this guy's become a thief. And, and so that very much did happen for a lot of tax collectors. Since they set their own wage, they had an opportunity to become very wealthy from taking money from everyone else. Okay, so pay attention to how it's worded. He was one of the most influential Jews in Roman tax collecting business. And he had become very rich, which means most people didn't like him. <laughs> he tried to get a look at Jesus but he was too short to see over the crowds. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore tree beside the road so that he could watch from there. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Only God could have known his name. I mean, you have this gigantic crowd. Jesus is coming through town. People are gathering all over the place, right? And Jesus looks up and sees this little man. And he says, Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down, for I must be a guest at your house today. What? <laughs> Out of all the people to pick, you pick Zacchaeus, the most influential, the most uh, prominent, most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business. One of the big shots of people who steal. <laughs> and you're saying, I have to be a guest at your house? Let's keep reading. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. The crowds were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. How could Jesus do this out of all the people's homes to go to? He picks the worst, the scum of the scum, and he's going to their house? You see, Jesus didn't... <laughs> he didn't see what they had done. He saw the potential that he created. He looked in their lives and didn't see all the, the errors, all the sin. He saw the potential that he had built inside of them, who he wanted them to become, right? The child that he had created, the giftings and abilities that God had placed there. And he saw the potential and the beauty that could come out of that. Not judgment and, and curses and no, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have overcharged people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Legally, you give back twice as much. He doubles the double. Okay, he's like, no, no, no. It's not good that I give them back what I've taken and that I double that. I'm going to give back four times as much as I have taken. If I have cheated someone, I'm going to pay them back four times as much to my own personal sacrifice, okay? And right off the bat, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor. Can you see the immense change that happened because Zacchaeus was chosen? Do you think that there would have been such a great change if Jesus had gone to 
a, a notorious saint, <laughs> right? There would have been no change. There would have been, oh, good job, you know? But here, he found someone that, that was like despised, a notorious sinner, and he gave a new opportunity for a new life. And he gave them like a brand new life. Like everything changed about Zacchaeus. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a son of Abraham. And I, the son of man, have come to seek and save those like him who are lost. Jesus' goal was not to help out people who were already good. He looked at the people that were hurting, people that were lost. And he gave them a new beginning. Think of the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Can you imagine her story? Let, let's look at Zacchaeus' story, right? I was a thief. I took from my own people. Everyone hated me. But God picked me. Jesus picked me. He wanted to come to my house. My life was forever changed the day that this man came into my home. He brought such honor to me, someone who is undeserving, and my life was changed because of it. Think of the woman caught in the act of adultery. I was before everyone ready to die. They were going to kill me. And Jesus stood there and said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And he gave me my life right back and a new start. And I didn't have to go back to my old ways. Can you imagine their story? Jesus became a part of their story. And so in the same way, we need to become a part in other people's story. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's the one who sets it all up. I guarantee you, okay? There's a reason why the person with the fishing pole is walking down the street and you have a love for fishing, okay? <laughs> God sets it all up. And we need to be looking for those opportunities to reach people with the message of Christ, to reach people in love. It's great, Mother Teresa said, do everything you can to reach people, and if all else fails, then use words. As in, love on people, care for people, um, accept them where they were at, see the potential that God has placed in their lives, and encourage them to begin to chase after that, as they discover who God is and begin to chase on, on who He is. God was looking for lost people to begin a complete change. I think of lost people as a person with a compass that has no markings. It's really cool. It's a little needle that spins around. It's like, wow, check that out. And you come in and in their lives can begin uh, to put that little N <laughs> on the top of the compass. And all of a sudden, now they have a goal to strive towards. And you can begin to do that. I've always said, listen, it's not my job to convict people. It's not my job to be like, what you're doing is wrong. I leave that to the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do a work in their hearts. It's my job to bring them biblical truth, to begin to show and teach them you know, what, what the Bible says, what God is saying, and help them to spiritually mature. But I allow the Holy Spirit to minister to them and begin to cause conviction in their heart because it is from that that a change will come in. It's not, listen, we're not uh, wooden puppets with a little Jiminy Cricket <laughs> on our shoulder telling us, oh, I should probably not do that. You should probably do that. We don't have that, but what we do have is, is the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to do what it needs to do, then when a person reaches the decision themselves, then they go for it with all their heart. I can't be the one to sit and say, you're doing good here, you're doing bad here, because what happens when I'm not there? The Holy Spirit is always there. The Holy Spirit has complete wisdom into all situations, and they need to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. It's not our job to convict and condemn. Let God minister to people, okay? Our job is to do what Christ did and see the potential in people the way God does, to see what lies beneath the surface, the giftings that he has placed there, and to begin to help them understand and see their story. Because when they get to look back and be like, God had me in the palm of his hand my entire life. I didn't know him and I didn't recognize him at these points in my life. But he was always there and they get to begin to have a testimony. And they can begin to reach out to people in such a way that no one else could reach because of their testimony and what God has done in their lives. And in that, 
in that retrospect, we are all meant to do the same thing, to begin to cultivate our story and who God made us to be, to be able to share that with people at any given time. I also think of um, when you're chasing after God, when you're in deep love with God, fruit of the Spirit tends to come out, right? And, and if you saw me, because you know me a little bit more, okay? And I was mumbly and grumbly and in the corner and sulking. You'd probably come by and ask, you know, uh, what's going on, Luigi? <laughs> do you need some prayer? Do you need some love, brother? Well, what's going on, right? And you would take the time to do that. But if you didn't know me, right, and I'm some old crotchety man in the corner sulking and cursing, and then you'd probably, you know, like avoid me like the plague, <laughs> right? But the fruit of the Spirit... Okay, joy, kindness, gentleness, self-control, love. When you begin to exhibit those things and people see in you a joy, a peace, self-control, people are attracted to people like that. I don't know if you realize, but if I'm an old crotchety man in the corner, you're probably going to avoid me. But if I'm smiling and jumping and happy and excited and you're like, what the heck has this guy got that I don't? I want to be happy and excited too. You know, and, and so I start to attract people. In the same way, when you have the Spirit of God resting heavily on you and you begin to uh, exude joy and peace and gentleness and kindness, people can't help but be attracted to you. And, th and then as they get to know you and you begin to share the joy of life and they're like, what is it about you that makes you so different? How are you always so happy? How? It is then that you can begin to have the opportunity to tell them because of God. You know, and, and then take that opportunity to share who God is and the story, your story, what God has done in your life and how God affects every day of your life. And that will reach people in powerful ways. <laughs> I think of Moses when you haven't read the whole story. Okay, and you read Moses' story and it's like, why did God choose Moses? Moses was very happy, uh, like he'd given up on his people. He was very happy, you know, uh, tending to his father's flocks, living everyday life as it came, uh, a lot more relaxed pace, and God's like, I want this guy. And, and I'm like, um, God, well, I'm sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> and then you read the whole story, and it's like, no, 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 Moses had a passion for his people. Moses left everything that he knew living under Pharaoh because he wanted to make a difference in his people. And he had committed a crime at that point and then ran away. And, but in his heart, he had wanted to make a difference for his people. And when you read it at the end, you're like, no, no, God chose the perfect person. <laughs> you know, when you look at Moses just by himself, it's like, he doesn't want the job. He's complaining. He wants you to pick his brother and he doesn't speak right. And he doesn't want the job. Why would you pick him? You know, but when you look at the end and the end result, you're like, God had picked the perfect person, a person who had the perfect story. And he picked the right person at the right time. And that's the way God works into reaching people. He picks the right person with the right story at the right time to be able to share to someone who is ready to receive because of all of that. And only God can orchestrate it so perfectly. But again, that is why it is so important that we pay attention to the people that we can reach for Christ. And don't forget, just because you took a person from minus 10 to minus 9 makes it no less important than the person you took someone from 8 to 10. And now they have given their all to Christ. Each step of the journey is important. And it's important that we, we obey God in every, every part of that. Okay. Now, on that note, it's important that you have a story, <laughs> that you're able to look back on life and be like, wow, God was here when, um, and that it's not like a 10 hour long story in case you don't have 10 hours to speak with someone, um, that you're able to be prepared to share who God has made you. Okay. And, and I'm thinking of, so here's my bookmark, 1 Peter 3.15. I've underlined it. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if you are asked about your Christian hope, what makes you different? Why can you smile? Why do you have this joy? Why do you have this hope? And if you are asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Now, dot, dot, dot. Don't forget the next verse, okay? But you must do this in a gentle and respectful way. 
right? You're not there to condemn other people because they're not where you're at. You were to love them where they're at, right? But you should always be prepared to explain the hope that you have in Christ, right? So you should have your story, how God has made a difference in your life. I think of John chapter 9, okay? When I think of stories, and I'm like, wow, this, this guy had it all, okay? And John chapter 9, verse 8, says this. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, and others said, now he just looks like him. But he himself insisted, no, no, I am that guy. <laughs> How then were your eyes opened, they asked. And he replied, the man that they called Jesus. He made some mud. He put it on my eyes. He told me to go in Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed. And then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked. I don't know, <laughs> he said. Think of his testimony. There was who he was before Christ had made a difference. He was blind. He was a beggar. People recognized that in him. Then there was a moment that Christ made a, a massive difference. He came, <laughs> made some mud on the ground, <laughs> okay, spit in the ground, made some mud, put it on his eyes, and said, go wash up. Okay, sure. And he went to go wash. He was obedient to God. And he went to go wash. Then he could see. You just got an entire testimony right there. Who he was before God. The difference that God made in his life. And who he is now because God has changed his life. All that. And some, like, all one day. Jeepers. It's all there. <laughs> it's like, I was blind. God came, gave me sight. Now, with my sight, I bring honor to God. Short, sweet, had it all. And people recognized who he was and that there was a difference and that God had made a difference. In the same way, we should all have a story. Uh, our story of how God has made a difference in our lives. And you can't sit there and tell me that God's made no difference in your lives. If you know him, <laughs> he has made a difference in your life. And you should be able to always explain how you can be so joyful and peaceful and, and have exuding kindness and gentleness with people uh, because God has made a difference in your life. So it's important that we practice our story. So evangelism is the ability to reach people with the message of Christ in such a way. Now, don't forget that a lot of the message of Christ is an incredible and powerful love, is a redemptive story. And, and you don't always have to, you know, give word by word account of the Bible. Get there eventually. It's important that you do. Okay, don't get me wrong. But when you love on people, when you do what Jesus did and be like, you know what, today I'm going to your house. I'm coming to your house to spend some time with you. I want you to be my host. I want to enjoy your presence. I want to be with you. Jesus spent time loving Zacchaeus. Called him by name. Zacchaeus, I have to be with you today. He loved on who he was. He loved the woman caught in the act of adultery. He didn't sit and condemn her for the sin that was so evident and her history of sin. He told her, go and sin no more. You've got a new shot at life, right? So have a story. Be able to love people. Always look for opportunities to care for and love the people around you in whatever capacity. And when God opens up the door, be ready to share your story. And be excited for being part of their story of how they get closer to God. You should always look for those opportunities. And God has them planned well before we were even born. The differences that we were going to make in the lives of the people around us. Evangelism is immensely important. If it is your gifting, you need to be trained up in it. Because you have a unique ability that when people who don't like God... <laughs> don't know God, may not like him, that when you're around them, their hearts are open and ready to receive. That it's not just going out and, you know, screaming at the top of your lungs about who God is and people being upset with you and walking away. You have a unique ability that God opens up people's hearts and he gives you a specific word in a specific time to be able to reach them with the love of Christ. And evangelism is immensely important in reaching out. And there are incredible moments of where the Holy Spirit is felt and people get to know God instantly. There are moments where you're going to give biblical truth to people and begin to discipleship them. There are moments that you'll have to be able to to dig up some proof, if you will, or, or some good arguments. You will meet all kinds of people. 
and <laughs> God will give you the right words in those times, and he prepares those meetings well in advance. Be true to your calling and begin to work in your calling. Once you realize you're evangelist, you can't help but be excited to hang out with people that don't know Christ because you wait and look for opportunity to bring hope and joy and love and change and new life in other people because the important part is eternity. Not so much what happens here on earth, but the important stuff is the eternity we spend with Christ. So the decision we make now is immensely important. Father God, I just pray that you give us incredible wisdom, incredible patience, love. I pray that the fruit of the Spirit just begins to exude around us, God, and you give us opportunity to reach the people around us, God, in a way that is effective, in a way that pierces their hearts, God. As Peter got up and spoke, it says that their hearts were pierced, that the words spoken in truth through the Holy Spirit pierced their very hearts. God, I pray for that, for my people, that you speak through them and into the hearts of the people around, that they can offer up hope, that they can share their hope and joy and love with the people around them. And people ask, where is this hope coming from? From. And you give us the wisdom and discernment to use the right words, God, to begin to pierce their hearts so that they can begin to understand that you do exist, that you do love them, that you do care, that you died for them. They were willing to be, that you were willing to die for them because of how much you love them. God, open up their hearts and their minds. Give us opportunity to speak into the world around us and give them hope that the world so desperately needs. God, continue to watch over and protect, protect us in all that we do. Jesus' mighty name I pray. Everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for, for listening every week. Um, looking forward to getting some time to speak with all of you. God bless you. Have a great week. Ciao.